first reading is the beautiful Psalm 40, verses 1 to 17. It's on the back of your blue handout. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard me cry, heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, there would be too many to declare. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. For troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head and my heart fails within me. Be pleased to save me, Lord. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. May all who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. May those who say to me, aha, aha, be appalled at their own shame. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say, the Lord is great. But as for me, I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. Second readings from Matthew, chapter 13, verses 24 to 43. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good, field, good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weed amongst the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed ears, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seeds in this field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then collect the wheat and bring it into my barn. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 30 kilograms of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables, which he did not say anything to them without using a parable. So it was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seeds is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seeds stand for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. 
As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so will, be, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out his kingdom, out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Good morning, everyone. Just let me wrestle with this stand for a second. Great. Thank you. Uh, If we haven't met before, my name is Andrew, and it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you all today. I'm really looking forward to unpacking the passage together, uh, but let me just start with prayer first. Heavenly Father, thank you for revealing your word through Jesus. Give us ears to hear what you're saying to us through your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. In the 1980s, Romania was 13 billion US dollars in debt. Communist leader Nicolae Ceausescu took extreme measures to pay back the debt in what is now known as the austerity policy. The prices of food, public transport, electricity and clothing were increased and heavily taxed to pay back the debt. Government spending was cut to schools, hospitals and housing, leading to the highest infant mortality rate in Europe and throwing people into poverty. Eventually, in 1989, there would be a revolution. The government would be thrown out, communism done in with and the period of modern Romania ushered in. But... Just before this revolution, a year or two earlier, a young British couple who couldn't have children were looking to adopt. A girl, in fact, they had always wanted. They didn't want to adopt from England, though, but from an Eastern European country where they felt they could give the baby a better chance at life. They looked at what was happening in Romania and decided they would adopt from there. However, they couldn't just take a child out of Romania, and so they paid a middleman to smuggle a baby girl from an orphanage. At the orphanage, this middleman had had to act very quickly and the boys and the girls were all dressed the same. And so when they delivered the baby to the British couple, to their surprise, they found they had been mistakenly delivered a boy instead. And this is not exactly what they had been waiting and hoping for all this time. All the time they desperately wanted a girl, but they took that little boy home and became a happy family. That is the true story of a friend of mine. 2,000 years ago, the Jewish people were also struggling under the rule of an oppressive government. Not the Romanians, but the Romans. The Jews knew that they were God's chosen people, and yet all they could see was the Romans occupying their land, taxing them heavily and oppressing them. They were waiting and praying in anticipation for what they expected, the arrival of God's kingdom. And this kingdom was the hope that they held on to, The hope that one day, just as the prophets had said, God would bring about his glorious reign over all. Many believed this would be the moment of their ultimate victory. They would have a new king in the line of David, the Messiah. They would be freed from their enemies, rule their own land, and see the Gentiles become subject to them. They were watching and waiting for the triumphant, unmissable arrival of God's kingdom. And this is the moment of history that Jesus was born into. In Matthew, Mark and Luke, Jesus' ministry begins with him announcing the arrival of this very kingdom. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, Jesus says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Can you imagine the excitement? Here comes someone announcing that the very thing the Jewish people had been waiting for was finally here. The kingdom of God is not about God having a kingdom in a place called heaven, but about God's sovereign rule over everything. In Matthew, it's called the kingdom of heaven, but it means the same thing. Yet, the reactions Jesus received to the announcement of this kingdom's arrival were mixed. After all, the Jews were waiting for their conquering Messiah King, who would overthrow Rome, subdue the Gentiles and establish God's rule over the world. Instead, they get this guy 
from a backwater town called Nazareth who says things like, the kingdom of heaven belongs to the poor in spirit, that the Jews do not get automatic entry into it, and that whoever takes the lowly position of a child is the greatest. This is not what they were waiting and hoping to hear. There was some overlap, to be sure, but it didn't look much like the arrival they were hoping for. A bit like receiving a boy when for hundreds of years they had been expecting a girl. In today's passage, the repeated theme of each parable is that they all tell us something about what the kingdom of God will look like when it's fulfilled. And let me just point out three little words across this passage that will be important as we understand what Jesus is teaching. So have a look with me. Firstly, look at verse 30. In the middle, there is the word until, until the harvest. Now look with me at verse 32 and find the word when, when it grows. And finally, in verse 33, again we see the word until, until it works all through the dough. So there's two untils, one when, and what do these words have in common? They all have to do with time. In each of these parables, there's a pivot, something that changes between the present and the future. There's both a now and a one day in view. There will be a difference between the arrival of the kingdom and its final fulfillment. The first glimpse we get of this fulfillment is in the parable of the weeds and wheat. Have a look with me. Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Jesus will come back and explain this parable to his disciples at the end of the passage, but not to the crowd. This is all they get. So let's take note of what's going on here. First, we have a man who sowed good seed in his field. Then an enemy comes and sows weeds in the same field, and the wheat and the weeds grow together. This doesn't seem like especially reassuring news. For starters, if this is like the kingdom of heaven, then is God asleep on the job? Has the enemy overcome his plans for the world? This is what it might have seemed like to the Jews and sometimes to us. Aren't there moments when you stand back and look at the world and think, how can God let this happen? And actually, the owner's response is surprising. When the servant suggests pulling out the weeds now, the owner says, no. Why? The weeds and the wheat are growing too closely together. It's impossible to remove one without damaging the other. Jesus says there will be a separation when harvest time comes. The wheat and the weeds will be gathered and burned respectively. But that still leaves us with questions. When will the harvest be? Who are the weeds and the wheat exactly? And why is God waiting? What we do know at this point is that the fulfillment of the kingdom means a harvest. The seed sown by the man and the seed sown by the enemy will be separated. And it is clearly the man who is in control of the situation. It is God who will bring his kingdom to fulfillment. And so we don't need to feel despair when we look at the world around us. God is not asleep on the job. He has a plan and that gives us hope. So God has a plan to bring his kingdom to fulfillment. That sounds great. But Jesus' first listeners, and maybe us as well, might then ask, well, if this kingdom has drawn near already, then where is it? And Jesus answers by describing the kingdom of heaven as like a mustard seed. Look at verse 31. Again, a man plants or sows a seed on his land. A mustard seed was tiny, but when fully grown, it became a good-sized plant, a few metres or so, and certainly one much bigger than what you'd expect from the seed. This is a picture of the kingdom of God. It will start small, it might be overlooked, it will be dismissed, and its greatness will go unnoticed. At least to start, but that's not all there is to it. Look at what it will one day become. One day the kingdom will be unmissable, so big that all will see it. God will bring his kingdom to fulfilment, and no one will overlook it then. And we see this same idea when Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast. If you're familiar with some of Jesus' teachings elsewhere, then you'll know that he also uses yeast as a negative image. But here it's a positive one. 
Yeast is small already, but once it's mixed in with the flour, it will become totally indistinguishable. Jesus says specifically that it is worked all through the dough. No one will even be able to tell that it's there. But soon enough, the dough will rise. And then everyone will see the yeast was there all along, having an impact far greater than its size. Just like the mustard seed, it will totally surpass first impressions. The final fulfilment of the kingdom will indeed be dramatic, which we'll see soon enough. But its arrival is not. The effect of the yeast is not visible immediately. And likewise, the kingdom won't first arrive in spectacular fashion. But God will bring his kingdom to fulfilment. The growing of the mustard seed and the rising of the dough are inevitable. But only once the dough has risen will the yeast's presence be made clear to everyone. Then it will be unmistakable. Maybe even just like how who Jesus really was only became clear once he had risen too. In the next few verses, rather than going straight to the explanation of the parable of the weeds, Matthew tells us that Jesus was speaking in parables to fulfill the Old Testament. In verse 35 it says, So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. That is a big claim. Jesus is saying, I will reveal things from the very beginning. Something only God was present for. Now, if you're anything like me, you might be prone to reading Old Testament quotations in the New Testament and then just keeping on going. But it's worth slowing down to actually look up what is going on. When a New Testament author quotes the Old Testament, he has the whole passage in view and not just the single line he's quoting. Here, Matthew quotes from Psalm 78. And I've got a few verses up on the screen. Uh, I'll first read from verses 2 to 4 and then verses 7 and 8. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. And then from verse 7, Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. They would not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation, whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. Earlier in chapter 13, Jesus also quotes the Old Testament on the use of parables. There he talks about them not revealing their meanings. But here, with the context of Psalm 78, clearly they're intended to reveal truths so that people will be faithful to God. So what's going on? Parables both conceal and reveal. If someone's heart is already turned away from God, then parables will confirm their position. They won't want to hear what God has to say. But if their heart is toward God and open to Him, then the parables will reveal things about who God is, what He has done and what He will do. The placement of this quotation just before the explanation of the weeds and the wheat is not a coincidence. You must listen, Jesus says. Don't be like your ancestors who failed to do so and were unfaithful. And you need to listen because a time is coming when the weeds and the wheat will be separated. Jesus tells us here clearly that when harvest time comes and the kingdom is fulfilled, there will be two groups, the weeds and the wheat. The wheat, those who are the people of the kingdom, verse 43 tells us, will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. They will experience the place where there will be no more mourning or crying or pain. God's fulfilled kingdom is how life was always meant to be. And how good will that be? But we can't ignore that at the same time, the weeds will be weeded out and thrown into the furnace where there will be great distress. And this harvest is final. The fate of the wheat is to be with God. The fate of the weeds is hell. God will bring his kingdom to fulfillment. And fulfillment requires a perfect kingdom, one totally free of sin. 
And this is what the Jews missed. Their ultimate enemy was not the oppression of the Romans, but their own sin, the thing that separated them from God. But that's the thing, isn't it? We're all sinners. The wheat and the weeds are also intertwined in us. None of us are good enough for the perfection of the kingdom. If we were left to ourselves, we'd all be being bundled up and burned in the fire. So we all need Jesus. Jesus washes us clean of our sins and will make us perfect at the harvest. And by acknowledging him as our Lord, our God and our Saviour, instead of facing death, we are made alive with him and welcomed as sons and daughters into his eternal, perfect kingdom. So now I want to talk to the two different groups in turn. And this is a topic that can make us feel uncomfortable, but Jesus wasn't afraid to talk about it. So first, let me ask you, which group are you in the wheat or the weeds even if you sit in church every sunday have a think about it to those who are among the wheat yes the world today is filled with sin and we are dismayed by our own sin too but we don't need to despair because god has a plan and that gives us hope one day All sin, including ours, will be removed when God's kingdom is brought to fulfilment. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 4, Paul says that Jesus gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Don't forget, it's not the good things that you do to impress God that will save you, but because you accepted what Jesus has already done for you. He died on that cross for you and your sin. And in the meantime, we have to be patient, not a passive patient where we just go to work, to school, to see friends, to church and just check the time every now and then. No, we are called to action as we follow the king of God's kingdom, our king, Jesus. So here's two things you can do actively while you wait. Firstly, we are the people of the kingdom. Jesus doesn't call us individual persons of the kingdom, but the people And that goes beyond just church on Sunday. Is your life characterised by being part of the people of the kingdom of God? And if not, what are you going to do to change that? The second thing is we need to pray. We need to pray and talk with our friends, family and neighbours about God's kingdom and where they will stand when it's fulfilled. One day it will be too late, but that day isn't here yet. So don't wait. Keep up your prayer for two. I've seen amazing answers to prayer with one of mine, and I know others have too. But now, turning to the other group, to those who think they might be among the weeds, hear what Jesus is saying to you today. You might look at the church and think the kingdom doesn't look all that great. And that's because even on its very best day, The church is just a glimpse of what the kingdom of God will be like. Right now, the church is still full of sinners too. And just like the rest of us, it is your sin that separates you from God. Just being a good person is not good enough. God's kingdom demands perfection. Can you honestly say you meet that standard? The kingdom can't be perfect if its people are merely good. As Jesus says, whoever has ears, let him hear. Don't be among those who have hardened your hearts to these parables. One day it will be too late, but that day is not here yet. The seed is still growing and the bread is still baking, but we don't know when it will be done, so don't wait. So what should you do? Just one thing. Make today the day that you acknowledge that you, like we all do, sin and are separated from God and that only Jesus can save you. If you're not quite ready to make that decision yet, then talk to someone. Talk to the person next to you. Talk to our senior minister, Rob. Talk to me. Ask questions. If you are hearing what this parable truly means, maybe for the first time today, 
then don't let the moment pass you by. Don't let the enemy snatch the kingdom from you. Jesus' explanation of this parable is a warning, but it's also a welcoming. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Our loving God invites you into his kingdom with open arms. The bread is still baking because he's waiting for you. He does not want you to be gathered with the weeds, but with the wheat. He wants you to be part of his kingdom. It's your call, but you're either in or you're out. There's no halfway option. Jesus has already overcome your greatest enemy, your sin. He's just waiting for you to see it and accept the rescue from the weeds he's already offering. God will bring his kingdom to fulfillment and he wants you to be a part of it. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you that you chose to reveal your kingdom through Jesus, not in spectacular military fashion, but in the form of a servant. Thank you that you invite each and every one of us to be part of that kingdom. We pray that many more will accept that invitation and we thank you for your loving patience. Even when we face sin in the world, help us to hold on to the certain hope that one day you will bring your kingdom to fulfilment. Father, let your kingdom come. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.